Okay, the usual metaphorical associations about gender, about say women and water, are between women and elemental water, femininity, fluidity, leakiness, all that sort of thing. But I'm more interested today in the analogy between women and infrastructures of water provision. Like the traditional housewife whose repetitive domestic labours serve to reproduce the houses and ordered and habitable space while providing food and shelter um, and other domestic services for its inhabitants to grow and thrive, so is the water supply system caught up in the everyday task of provisioning and reproducing members of society. In the first world, in first world or developed countries, this goes on in the inconspicuous background of metropolitan life and housing, just the way plumbing's built into it. But where municipal provision is unavailable or unreliable, the link between women and water provision is not at all metaphorical, but laborious and practical. Linking women's domestic labour with water infrastructure opens two initial lines of inquiry. What powers and effects do water infrastructures have with respect to women? And what powers and effects do women have with respect to water infrastructures? Gender usually enters fully formed in feminist discussions of water, or any discussions really, having presumably been constructed through social interactions and institutions like languages, classes, ideologies, religions, etc. But if we accept Latour's critiques of sociology for neglecting the constitutive role of non-human actants in society, we might see how what it means to be gendered woman or man varies not only according to social contexts, like property rights, marriage customs and so on, but also according to systems of provisioning, the infrastructures of everyday life. Thus, reliable urban water infrastructures and houses with multiple water outlets and hot water systems create a woman with very different degrees of health, freedom and servitude compared to one who grows up in a world where she risks making her children ill with water from a local untreated source, or has to trudge miles to fetch and carry it along with the fuel to heat it every day. Being a housewife means something different when doing the laundry is a one or two day communal activity compared to when it means pressing some buttons on a smart machine tucked behind a kitchen cupboard door on the way out to salaried work. These are material differences in experiences of provisioning and its associated labours. As such, they directly contribute to shaping or defining us as differently gendered bodies and beings. So a vexed question for sustainable materialism is how to achieve an appropriate balance between labour-saving water services and a sustainable level of water consumption. For as other feminist studies of labour and technologies have shown, a reduction in drudgery is normally accompanied by a or followed by a compensatory rise in housekeeping standards. Piped waters, sewers, showers and washing machines, new soaps and fabrics, medico-scientific and marketing discourses on hygiene, germs, freshness, more recently spotlessness and odourlessness, have all driven up cleanliness standards and water consumption as well. So a point here is that women are potentially in a good position to resist those drivers. On the other side of this, the effects of women on water infrastructures, um, Turton, Schreiner and Liestermarker argue that metropolitan provision represents a defeminisation of water. That is, although it provides women labour-saving benefits, it reduces their role in securing household water provision. Turning water into, quote, a pu purely a technical issue isolates women from decision-making roles because the water sector tends to be dominated by male engineers and technicians whose technical solutions present a facade of gender neutrality. So that would be one example of what I'm calling crypto gender. 
A little tiny example of this is smart meters, which allow consumers to make economically and technically rational calculations about how they use water or energy. These devices construct the householder as a techno-savvy micro-resource manager, to use, um, it's not my term, it's uh, Yolandi Stringers. But they do very little to alter the norms of sanitation, cleanliness and personal, personal hygiene that's driving that consumption. So once water provisioning is gathered into a system, a particular socio-technical law prevails, which is that power and water seem to flow in opposite directions. Women have most control and equity as end users, but their concerns are distant from centres of water power and policy, as these quotes indicate. First from these um, South African researchers, and in, or uh, South African and European actually, an inverse relationship seems to exist between seniority within water service bureaucracies and gender. Or even in less technocratic contexts like irrigation in the Andes, the degree of female control of irrigation decreases the further one moves upstream from the farm inlet to the main intake of the irrigation system. The opening up of water management to other stakeholders, including environmental protection advocates and departments, as well as NGOs concerned with equity, access, participatory democracy, even cultural flows perhaps, opens the prospects, um, Turton, Schreiner and Listermark argue anyway, opens the prospects for a re-feminisation of hydropolitics because this opened up more democratic space uh, could potentially make women's voices and concerns more audible and influential in water planning and decision making. Okay, now I'm on to industry understandings of um, domestic water consumption. Progress on the social dimensions of sustainability in Australia has been stymied by a number of historical factors that I can't address here, but one major issue in the water sector is over-reliance on simplistic social categories. Water has conventionally been supplied to whole populations composed supposedly of average users or individual customers who demand an average number of litres of water per day. These are aggregated into households, the actual unit at which domestic water use is metered and billed and demand management programs targeted. In case you're wondering, this is, this is a picture of a house from a 2005 Sydney Water Education Kit where um, a quarter of, you know, around that time, a quarter of a Sydney's household water was used in laundries. There's not a single washing machine shown here. Nearly all the water is consumed by women. There is one woman and about seven men. Or maybe there's two women and about seven men or something. Anyway, okay. This notion of the household as a unit is another case of crypto-gender, as Kuntala Lahiri Dutt explains, quote, for many years programs dealing with irrigated agriculture, domestic water supply, environmental sanitation and industrial development have seen the household as the lowest unit of production, consumption and decision making. Yet it's been clearly established that in most cultures, men and women, often supported by children, do different work, have different access to resources and different areas in which they can make decisions and exercise control over resources and benefits. So considering the household as a unit, erases intra-household differences in consumption and makes any gender analysis different, diffi difficult, sorry. It similarly obscures differences in water use related to generation and cultural background within a house, where a variety of practices may coexist in the same household. And this has been found in water diary studies that Fiona and Alan and I did, and subsequently others have done in Auckland, Lusaka, Canberra, stuff like that. How can, socially adapt, how can socially sustainable strategies for urban water management or climate change adaptation be developed when such basic facts 
of society as gender and generation are denied. The water industry prefers market research and statistically analysable data and only rarely funds the kind of qualitative research that reveals the diversity of water consumption practices both within and across households, though that is changing a little. To the water industry it seems the household is like a little boat sailing all alone on the ocean of the suburbia. But I think a more culturally intelligent approach would be to uh, see the household as a node with connections to the many networks in which its different members participate. For example, uh, water saving messages for young people would be better disseminated through peer subcultures and shared media platforms, not enclosures in household water bills. This is the kind of cultural intelligence the water industry sometimes needs. As in the developing world, residential demand management or innovation programs here that would involve networks of women or of men or special interest groups might be more successful than those pitched at the private heterosexual couple. And there's work on networking by Fowler and Christakis that could support this. Okay, the last bit, institutions and policies of water governance. Gender is not always hidden in relation to water, though as Lahiri Dutt observes, it is common to see water as a gender issue only when associated with poverty in developing countries. Water policy analysts, um, these are Australians, Davidson and Stratford, find that despite Australia being a supporter of UN policy statements that are about sustainability, the 1992 Dublin principles, which recognise the centrality of women to water management and so on. Despite this, these positions are largely unreflected in the institutional arrangements for water management. Awareness of the importance of gender and water at the supranational level has not been translated in any obvious way to water policy at the national level, which again still appears gender neutral, quote, a gloss that masks and naturalises a masculinised norm. This is another case of crypto gender, I suppose. That these authors argue an inquiry into gender and water systems is less likely to reveal overt sexism than a masculinist bias, and we should say a sort of Euro-white masculinist bias, I suppose, in the way the whole discourse is set up around quantitative, pragmatic and positivist forms of knowledge and how it has historically privileged technical and managerial approaches for extracting and exploiting water over a more holistic approach based on an ethics of care towards the environment, society and the less powerful. One of the points they make is that most Australian water policy is just based around extractive uses and doesn't actually even have a category for non-extractive uses, which is one reason why Indigenous people have also had to invent, in a way, the concept of cultural flows, I think, because, you know, something that wasn't just exploiting the water was just couldn't even be thought. So none of the women in the water industry or women researchers on water that participated in my recent study on the links between the water industry and humanities, arts and social science researchers, none of these people really complained of overt sexism in the water sector, though many complained about the dominance of science as a master discourse. Um, the, the epistemological monocularism, monocularism of their scientific and engineering colleagues who valued no knowledge beyond objective data generated through positivist paradigms and who could not accept the validity of alternative worldviews or knowledge frameworks. If male scientists, engineers and technocrats comprise the dominant crypto gender in water management, women are the hidden majority in related social research on water. Of over 150 individuals listed in Tributaries, a 2011 directory of social and cultural urban water researchers, research managers and knowledge brokers, 60% were women. 
The project workshops attracted twice as many female participants as males, while there were 58 women, 20 men and one transgender person at the recent Tapping the Turn conference, like a ratio of about three to one. This is a significant overrepresentation compared to their proportion amongst technical water professionals. If you go along to an Oswater conference, it's about 80% men. But despite recognising its need for more cultural and social intelligence, the water industry still has not redefined its core business to include the, that expertise and instead keep social and cultural researchers as outsourced contracted knowledge providers with little power or opportunity to define the questions they are commissioned to research. So, my conclusion then, very much the same as Gisley's actually. Um, from where I sit as a first world cultural researcher, my conclusion is that socially sustainable flows of urban water will require more flows of knowledge and expertise from the Haas sector into the water sector. That's it.